Tasha McClellan, Cervical Cancer Program Coordinator at SHARE. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a national nonprofit that supports, educates, and empowers anyone who has been diagnosed with women's cancers and provides outreach to the general public about signs and symptoms. We are a compassionate community of knowledgeable survivors, women living with cancer, and healthcare professionals. SHARE is dedicated to serving women of all races, cultures, and backgrounds, and identities. Because no one should have to face breast, ovarian, uterine, cervical, or metastatic breast cancer alone. For more information, please visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. All participants will be muted during the presentation. When Dr. Garrick finishes presenting, we will begin the Q&A discussion. You are welcome to submit questions during the presentation during, through the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. When asking questions, please remember that Dr. Garrick is unable to give specific medical advice, so please keep your questions general in nature. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on the short SHARE website soon. Now, with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce our speaker, who is also my oncologist and saved my life, uh, Dr. Garrick. Dr. Paula Garrick is a distinguished professor at the and chief of division of gynecologic oncology in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of North Carolina. She completed her undergraduate medical school training at the University of Florida. She completed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Virginia. And upon completion of her gynecologic oncology fellowship at UNC, she has remained there where she spends half of her time in patient care and the other portion in administrative work. She has authored or co-authored over 160 peer-reviewed articles. Thank you. Well, thank you for that very nice introduction, Aisha, and I really appreciate and I'm honored to be able to speak with everybody today and I look forward to all your excellent questions and hope I can answer some of them to your satisfaction. So I'm gonna share my screen. So we're going to talk a little bit about cervical cancer 2022, um, and I hope everybody can see my screens. I will keep going unless I hear otherwise. So just some general statistics about cervical cancer. Um, so in terms of all cancers, these are the numbers that we're going to see in, in 2022. These are, of course, estimates. And you see that cervical cancer is actually not on the list of the top ones in the United States, which is wonderful. You will see uterine corpus cancer. Those are endometrial cancers, and those have steadily risen. Over the 20 years of my career, this has gone from about 40,000 cancers to about 66,000 cancers a year. If you look down in terms of the mortality from the cancers, you see that although ovarian cancer is not one of our most common cancers, it is the most lethal of our cancers. When we think about cervical cancer, it is a disease that has different incidences or risks depending on where you are with your age. The lifetime risk is roughly one in 150 women will get cervical cancer in the United States. Up to the age of 49, that risk is about one in 362. The risk decreases as you get a little bit older until you get over 70, at which time the risk does increase to about one in 600 women. Sorry, it's advancing. So if you think about cervical cancer, fortunately, most patients have early disease. About 50% of our patients are gonna be diagnosed with stage one disease. You can see on this slide, however, there are some differences amongst the races. So for example, for early stage cancer, White patients are diagnosed with stage one disease about 46% of the time, whereas our black patients are diagnosed with early stage disease about 36% of the time. In terms of distant disease, you can see that our black patients have a higher risk of having distant disease at the time of diagnosis as compared to our white patients. There's a number of reasons for this, and this is an area of very active research and investigation. If you look at survival by stage and race, clearly the earlier your cancer is diagnosed, the better you should do. But even if we look at our patients who have localized disease or stage one disease, we still see that there's an opportunity or there's a gap between the outcomes in our black patients and our outcomes in our white patients. And we continue to see this gap when we look at patients who have disease that's not just localized to the cervix, but it's in the region of the cervix, so it's not metastasized in those patients who have distant disease. And then if you kind of put all stages together, we see that there is still a discrepancy in how our black patients do compared to our white patients. And there's a number of reasons for this, including access to care and receiving guideline directed care, which seems to be an issue for some of our patients, unfortunately. 
So what is cervical cancer? I know many of you probably had the opportunity to hear a little bit about the HPV vaccine and HPV, um, but cervical cancer is a cancer of the female genital tract. It is the most common cause of cancer deaths worldwide. So not here in the United States, but worldwide, it is the most common cause of cancer-related deaths. It is the easiest GYN cancer to, present, to prevent through screening and vaccination, and we're gonna talk quite a bit about that. The average age is about 50 years of old age, but the precancerous changes can start anywhere from five to 15 years earlier. That's why it's so important to keep up with your pap smear screening, to get your HPV vaccination, and if you have an abnormal pap smear, to follow along with recommendations for screening and treatment of those precancerous uh, changes. So where does the cervix and all of these body parts sit? So if you look at the cervix there, that the opening of the uterus. It's the kind of the gateway between the vagina and the uterus is what holds a pregnancy in place. And it's what dilates before you have a vaginal delivery. Other organs that are important in this area, and they're going to be really important as we talk about some of the side effects of treatment, include the ovaries, uh, particularly if we start thinking about radiation and radiation exposure can cause premature menopause in some of our patients. And we'll talk a little bit about this in terms of survivorship. We talked a little bit about what is the general incidence of cervix cancer by age groups. And again, that you know, roughly one in 150 women are gonna get cervix cancer. But if you think about bigger picture, let's, you know, if you think about this as an iceberg, there'll be about 50 to 60 million abnormal pap smears per year. About three to 5 million women are gonna have an abnormal pap smear. There's gonna be about 12,000 cases of cervix cancer, and that should be about 4,000 deaths, not 4.000, so 4,000 deaths. So just because you have an abnormal pap smear does not mean that you're gonna get cervical cancer. And I think is that's a very important message because sometimes people have an abnormal pap smear and they become so paralyzed and fearful that they don't follow up because they're fearful of what they're gonna to be told when in fact they could actually prevent the diagnosis. So what causes cervical cancer? HPV, HPV, HPV. Um, it is the most common cause of cervical cancer. Now there's a couple other things that can lead to cervical cancer, but this is really the most prevalent. This is something that you get through sexual intercourse, but I would not consider this a sexually transmitted infection the way that you would think about some other infections such as gonorrhea, chlamydia, or syphilis. And that just because you have an abnormal pap smear and you're diagnosed with HPV today doesn't mean you got it from your partner from a week ago. This could be a partner that you had in a previous life, or if it's your same partner, it could be an infection that they had, but then became active from one of their prior partners. There's a series of low risk as well as high risk HPVs. The low risk ones typically cause condyloma or warty changes, and those tend to be HPV 6 and 11 most common. The high risk HPVs primarily are number 16 and 18. 16 and 18 cause 70% of all the cervical cancer cases that we'll see. Overall, there's about 14 what we consider oncogenic HPV strains. And what that means is these are HPVs that your body is less likely to clear spontaneously. These are the HPVs that get integrated into your cell's DNA and then lead to the precancerous and cancerous changes. Cervical cancer is widely preventable. There's always going to be exceptions, but it really is widely preventable. And part of that is HPV vaccination. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Screening is important, such as keeping up with your pap smears, but not just your pap smear, but we now do HPV co-testing with pap smears. And then the importance of treating pre-invasive disease or treating your dysplasia before it becomes cancer. So how can you prevent cervical cancer? So again, we've got to stay up to date on your screening. HPV vac vaccination, currently the um, non-avalent or the nine HPV strain vaccine is what we would recommend. This overall will account for about 90% of cervical cancers and 90% of the oropharyngeal or head and neck cancers. So not only is HPV responsible for cancers of the female genital tract, including cervical cancer, vaginal cancer, and vulvar cancer. It's also been tied to anal cancer, oral cancers, uh, and some lung cancers. Ultimately, and I think everybody's heard a lot about herd immunity as we think about this global pandemic and the COVID vaccination, but ultimately herd immunity could also eliminate HPV and its related cancers. And I'm going to show you a little um, article clip from Australia and in terms of how they anticipate that they're going to be able to completely eradicate HPV and its related cancers. 
If you look over to the graphs, you're gonna see cervical cancer incidence per 100,000 women. And you can see here the expectation of what the HPV vaccine is gonna do in terms of cervical cancer incidence as we get further out to 2023. That's a significant improvement in terms of cervical cancer incidence. And then as we look at cervical cancer mortality per 100,000 women, you see that that's also similarly declining just as incidence decreases, so will death rates. So the key thing is let's stop cervical cancer before it starts. So again, 16 and 18 account for 70% of all squamous cell carcinomas of the cervix. HPV 18 can also account for adenocarcinoma of the cervix. So the cervix has two parts. The outside of the cervix is the squamous and the inside of the part cervix is the adenocells. So a good way to think about it, it's sort of like your lips. Um, you have the transition from the outside part of your lips to the inner part of your mouth. And that's a similar transition in the cervix. What, what HPV does is it has oncoproteins. And so E6 and E7 are the two oncoproteins that, that affect both P53 and RB. These are tumor suppressor genes and they do just what they say. When working appropriately, P53 suppresses tumors from starting, RB suppresses tumors from starting. So then if these are knocked out by E6 and E7, then a tumor cell is allowed to propagate and you get dysplastic changes. And as I mentioned, it, cervical uh, HPV causes a number of types of different cervical cancers that you can see in the cartoon on the bottom of the right-hand side. So how does this happen? And here's, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, but this is that outside transition to inside transition that I was talking about. Here, you're more likely to have the squamous cell cancers. Here, you're more likely to have the adenocarcinomas, but it's in this transition zone where HPV is particularly active. So the steps are you get infected with an oncogenic HPV, the HPV persists, meaning your body isn't able to clear it for any number of reasons. And some of the risk factors include just your own body's constitution, if you're immune suppressed for any reason, if you're taking steroids, um, smoking, all those things can lead to increased persistence of the HPV um, infection. And then you get a persistent clone of cells that then become precancerous, and then those can become cancerous. So it's very important when we look at a woman's cervix who has an abnormal pap smear, we wanna be able to see this transformation zone very clearly, because that's a very active area for this transition from precancer to cancer. So how common is HPV? Really, almost every sexually active individual will have been exposed to HPV at some point in their life. 75% of sexually active individuals who, uh, who identify with being women will have been exposed by the age of 18 to 22. Another great question that a lot of people ask is, can you ever get rid of HPV? Yes, your body's immune system usually clears HPV infections. So again, that little triangle that I showed you that you know, there's five, 50 to 60 million abnormal pap smears, but only 12, 14,000 cases of cervix cancer, you see that most people are able to clear this. And clearly 75% of individuals aren't gonna get cervix cancer. And the scary question is, you know, just because I have HPV, will I get cancer? No, in most cases, HPV goes away. So don't be scared of seeing your doctor following up and getting it treated. We talked a little bit about this. So what other cancers does HPV cause? So cervical cancer, vulvar cancer, which is a cancer of the labia. You can get vaginal cancers. So in some women who had, for example, maybe cervical dysplasia or abnormal changes of their cervix, they underwent a hysterectomy to treat that. The HPV stays persistent in the vagina and you can get a vaginal cancer. Penile cancer, anal cancers, and oral pharyngeal cancers. The timeline from getting exposure to HPV and developing dysplasia to cancer is a long process. On average, it takes about five to 10 years. So there are opportunities to intervene with care to prevent the cancer. The key thing is, is listening to your body, advocating for yourself. And if you have an abnormal pap smear, making sure that it's followed up in the appropriate way. 
things that can increase the risk of cancer. We touched about, you know, smoking. If you have a high risk HPV, so for example, if you have HPV 16 or 18, and that's part of what we look for when we do the HPV co-testing with your pap smear, what co-testing is, is when you have your pap smear, you also have an HPV test. And if your HPV is positive for high risk HPV versus negative, that determines the frequency with which we would need to do your pap smears, or if we would need to do what's called a colposcopy or looking at your cervix a weakened immune system, if you have a history of HSV2 or herpes type 2, and having other sexually transmitted infections can also increase your risk of developing cancers. So the HPV vaccine um, nearly will lead to about a 90% reduction in cervical cancer, but it is composed of two low risk and seven high risk HPV types. It's most effective if given between the ages of nine to 12 years. When we're younger, our immune systems are more robust and we're able to really accept the benefit of the vaccine a little bit better, but you can catch up. So ideally you wanna be treated before the age of 26, but the FDA has now approved a catch up vaccine for adults up to 20, uh, from 27 to 45. If you're less than uh, uh, 15 years of age, you only need to have two doses. If you're greater um, than 15, you need to have three doses at one, two and six months. So will vaccination work? So this is work done out of Australia. Um, and they found that by 2028, fewer than four women in every 100,000 would be diagnosed with cervical cancer in Australia. And by 2066, they think that one woman per year could receive that diagnosis. Just think about that. 2066 sounds like a really long time from now, but that really is only 40 years. So in a generation, they're going to eradicate cervical cancer from Australia because of their HPV vaccination programs. I think that's something we should really aspire to here in the United States. So what is a pap smear? So um, most people have had a pap smear, but this is sort of what the process is. Um, a speculum is inserted. We look at the cervix or the vagina, whichever part of the body is still there. We submit a sample and then the pathologist, this is kind of an older slide. Um, now most of the pap smears are liquid based um, and it's not necessarily put on a slide like it used to be when I was started my training, but it's the same concept. They're looking for abnormal cells. In terms of the recommendations, um, the recommendations are from age 21 to 29 to have a pap smear every three years, as long as they're normal. It was every three years is fine. And then you could consider primary high-risk HPV testing in women who are 25 years and older. So you could just have an HPV test and that's every bit as good as a pap smear. From the age of 30 to 65, it's recommended that you have pap smear and HPV testing every five years or even consider HPV testing alone every five years. And then after the age of 60, assuming you've had adequate negative screening, you don't need any additional pap smears. However, if you have had a prior high grade dysplasia and were treated for that, you need to continue routine screening for 25 years. And it doesn't matter if this leads you beyond the year of 65. So this is really important for our patients as they get older. You said, yep, yeah, I treated you for your cervical dysplasia at 55 you get to finish this at age 80. You don't get to just finish um, at age 65 because that's when you transition to um, Medicare, for example, you need to continue your pap smears. This is what's happened with the um, advent of, of pap smears alone. So if you look at the incidence of cervical cancer per 100,000 women, there's been a 75% decrease from the 1940s when Dr. Papa Nicolau um, started the pap smear to the 1980s. And now the next leap is really gonna be as a result of HPV vaccination. And you know, could we strive to do what they are gonna be able to do in Australia and essentially eradicate uh, cervical cancer by the mid 2060s? So there's a series of guidelines that we all follow for follow-up of abnormal pap smears. And like everything else in life, there's an app for that. So um, this is uh, something that you can download and you can put your age, your HPV status, whether you're pregnant or not, and what your results were from your pap smear. And then it'll tell you what the next step should be in terms of follow-up. And these are updated constantly. So if your provider were to say something that's really discrepant and doesn't follow what these guidelines are, that would be a really good point of conversation and discussion with your provider. What is the goal of screening? The goal of screening is really to prevent morbidity and mortality from cervical cancer. We're trying to identify those precancerous lesions and be able to treat them effectively before they become cancer. 
The goals, in addition to decreasing the risk of cervical cancer, is we need to minimize psychological distress. We need to minimize the pain, bleeding, discharge, side effects from the treatments that we offer. And we need to also make sure that we leave a person with a healthy cervix to decrease the risk of preterm deliveries and miscarriages from the procedures we perform. If you look at just cervical, mild cervical dysplasia, or CIN1, and that stands for cervical intraepithelial neoplasia 1, the majority of patients, 57%, who have a biopsy that shows low-grade dysplasia, it's going to regress on its own. So 57% of the time, your body's going to take care of it. 32% of the time, it stays the same. And there's really a small risk of patients that it's going to progress to a high-grade lesion or even to cancer. Now, you see those numbers are different if your biopsy shows CIN2 or CIN3, that the risks of progression to cancer are higher. So because of these data, we typically follow patients who have CIN1 and spare them a lot of painful, potentially harmful treatments, and really try to tailor those treatments to women who have CIN2 and CIN3. So if you have an abnormal pap smear, what do we do? We do what's called a colposcopy. And colpos is the, the Latin word for body, and so the uterus is the the, the body of the womb. And so we're looking at the body or the cervix with a microscope and that's the oscopy. So it's nothing more threatening than we place a speculum and we look at your cervix with a microscope. Sometimes we apply different, different things to tint the cervix. Um, sometimes we apply acetic acid, which smells like um, what you would use to color Easter eggs with or vinegar. Um, it helps the areas of abnormality look bright or white so we're able to see them. Lugol's is another stain that we use and that the normal cervix will stain brown and the ab area of abnormality will stain yellow. So we're able to really see the abnormality better. Remember we talked a little bit earlier about being able to see that transformation zone or that very critical part of the cervix where these abnormalities really take hold. We need to say if your colposcopy was adequate, could we see your entire transformation zone? And just because we're looking at your cervix with a microscope doesn't mean we're gonna do a biopsy. If you have an abnormal uh, colposcopy and you have an abnormal biopsy, you know, we talked a little bit about it already. If you have a low grade biopsy, we usually just follow up with our patients because it usually goes away. If you have a high grade lesion, there's a couple of options to take away that area of abnormality as there is a higher risk of persistence of the abnormality or even progression to cancer. And then if you have a cancer, we really tailor the treatments based on stage and what the fertility desires are for the individual. So here's just a cartoon of what a colposcopy is. So a speculum is placed like it would normally be placed for your pap smear or your well woman exam. And then we look with this microscope at the cervix. And again, we sometimes put acetic acid or Lugol's or other things on that. So all of that microscope stays outside of your body. Sometimes individuals will come to the clinic and they see the microscope and they think that I'm putting that inside them. All of that stays outside. It really just feels like a normal speculum exam. So pre-cancer, cervical pre-cancer is called cervical dysplasia. And again, low grade usually does not require treatment. I know I'm drilling this point home, but it is a shame when I see women who had low grade or individuals who had low grade dysplasia and they had a lot of treatment that damaged their cervix. So it really requires just close monitoring. Most low grade dysplasia is going to go away, away um, with time. High grade dysplasia usually does require treatment. However, there are circumstances in which we follow people closely. For example, if the individual is pregnant, we would not necessarily treat a high grade lesion. We would follow it during pregnancy to make sure it doesn't become a cancer. Also in really young individuals who have high grade um, dysplasia, they tend to have a higher rate of it resolving. And as long as you can ensure good follow-up and compliance, I have followed patients with CIN2 who are young and the majority of them, it does regress on their own, but you really need to have a conversation with your patient to make sure that they understand the importance of follow-up. High-grade dysplasia can progress to cancer, but it doesn't happen all the time. CIN3 progresses to cancer 12% of the time. That means the other percent of the time, or 88% of the time, it will not, but we can't predict which woman will or will not progress. So we have to follow everybody and treat everybody carefully. So you've heard me talk a lot about what cervical dysplasia is. And so I think the cartoon really helps. So these are the abnormalities. If you look at the, the, the chart on the left, these are the abnormalities the pathologist is looking at. 
And part of what they're looking at is you see the little nucleoli here, and this is the cell. They're looking for a change in the ratio of this little dot to the big cell. So you see as the cells become more and more abnormal, that ratio becomes smaller and smaller. So this part of the cell becomes the majority of the cell as compared to this side. So this is what a normal cell looks like. The nuclear size is normal. Low-grade dysplasia, you start to have some abnormalities going up. And so when we do a pap smear, we essentially are scraping off this top layer and this is what the pathologists look like. And so if you think about CIN1, it's going about one third of the way through the epithelium. CIN2, it's going two thirds of the way. CIN3, it's going all the way. So it's nothing more than one thirds, two thirds, three thirds, um, or complete. And you see, as you get a little bit more dysplastic, this nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio changes. And then the depth of abnormality increases. This is all pre-cancer. This is another way to look at it. So again, you see the normal cells. These are actual, rather than this cartoon, these are actual biopsies. This is normal. And you can see that kind of normal pale progression. This is CIN1. You see the difference here is about one third. Here, CIN2, it's about two thirds. And over here on the last slide, you see that the changes are all the way through. What defines a cancer is when these changes go down. So the changes up include dysplasia, the changes down become cancer. And those are the things that we're looking for on the biopsies. And this is again, a cartoon of just that. Again, the one third, the two thirds, the all the way. And then when it goes down, that becomes the invasive component. So how is dysplasia? How are these precancerous lesions treated? So again, kind of a similar cartoon like I showed you before. This is the transformation zone. This is the area where most of those abnormalities happen. A leap is something that we can do in the office. And we just take this little wire loop. What happens is you come to the office, we place a speculum in, we look to see the lesion. These loops that we use, the leap wires come in a variety of different sizes. So we base the size based on the size of your cervix and the size of your precancerous change. We then numb up the cervix and then do the procedure. It does cause some cramping. Most people are able to tolerate it in the office really, really well, particularly if your provider really tells you what they're doing and they go step by step. And then this piece is removed and that is sent to pathology for them to look, look at. And then we use um, some cautery to stop the bleeding. A cone is a similar procedure, but that's done in the operating room. Why would you do a leap versus a cone? Sometimes I'll do a cone if somebody has a really, really long cervix and a really, really small lesion because the loops only come in so many sizes. So again, the goal is to treat the dysplasia without harming the cervix. So if I can't tailor the size of what I need to do based on the size of the leap wires that we have available, then we'll do a cold knife cone. The other way to think about it is that a leap is a little bit more like a cake cone that you eat ice cream with. You might never want to eat ice cream again versus the cold knife cone is more like a sugar cone. So if we need to get a little bit higher in the canal, the cone is really helpful with for that. So what are some signs and symptoms of cervix cancer? So abnormal bleeding, this could be bleeding in between your cycles. It can be bleeding after intercourse. It could be that you have a long, heavy period that you don't stop bleeding. You're just bleeding continuously. That can be also a sign of other things, but cervical cancer um, would be in the differential. If you have pain, either abdominal or pelvic pain with intercourse or all of the time, leg swelling, abnormal kidney function, unexplained weight loss, or an abnormal vaginal discharge. So if you are diagnosed with cervix cancer, sometimes we can see the lesion and we would biopsy it and make the diagnosis in that way. Sometimes you have an abnormal pap smear and you have colposcopy, a biopsy, and either the leap or the cone that we talked about earlier, and that's how we make the diagnosis. If you have a cancer diagnosis, we might do a series of things to complete the workup so we could really see what the best treatment is gonna be for you. And that can include an ultrasound, a CT scan, an MRI, or even a PET CT. The staging of cervical cancer changed in 2018, and I don't expect you guys to be able to read through this, but it, suffice it to say is that just because you have cervix cancer, there are a variety of different stages and a variety of different treatments available for each of those stages. So if you're diagnosed with cervix cancer, it's really being able to communicate with your provider to know exactly what you're dealing with and know what the options are for your stage. 
It may be that you have a stage 1A1 cervix cancer and you could just be treated with a cone and have a pregnancy versus your friend had a stage two cervix cancer and she had to have radiation. So don't assume if you're talking to friends or other people because they had a cervix cancer and had one treatment that you're gonna have the same thing. The risk of lymph node spread increases with stage of disease, which is why it's so important to try to make the diagnosis of cervical cancer early because then we're much more successful with treatment and cure. You definitely need to advocate for yourselves and your friends. You need to see a gynecologist or a GYN oncologist if you have symptoms that are worrisome for cervix cancer. And if they really can't find a clear reason, please keep advocating. So treatments include cold knife cone. You can have a hysterectomy. Sometimes we do what's called a radical hysterectomy, which is removing a little bit more tissue from around the cervix to get negative margins around the cancer. A radical trachelectomy is where we remove the cervix itself, but we leave the uterus. And this is important for individuals who have not had the opportunity to complete their families. This allows us to treat their cancer and still allow them to have a family if that is their desire. Lymph node evaluation, either with sentinel lymph nodes or full lymph node dissection is part of the staging for early stage cancers. If you don't have an early stage cancer that's amenable to surgery, then we talk about radiation. We talk about giving chemotherapy with the radiation. That chemotherapy in this setting really just helps the radiation work better. And the analogy I use is if you're going boxing in a boxing ring and Mike Tyson hits you um, before you go in, you're not gonna survive against a Vander Holyfield. And this is sort of what the chemotherapy does with the radiation. It sort of sen sensitizes the cancer cells to the effects of radiation, so the radiation is more effective. The chemotherapy can also help treat some any microscopic disease that might be outside of the area that we know, and that's why outcomes are better. Sometimes we do chemotherapy alone, and now there's a whole group of new, really exciting agents called targeted therapies. Um, and one of the great things has been, you know, in the last three years, we have had more new treatments for women with cervix cancer than we have in the prior 20 years of my career. So it really is a wonderful time to be a provider, to be able to offer all these options to our patients. So if you have early stage disease, these would all consider early. You can have a number of treatments that, that include fertility sparing treatments. So just because you have a cervix cancer doesn't mean you couldn't still have a family. Um, I'm not going to read all of these, but you see that you do have choices and you do have options. And it's important to talk to your provider about these, these treatment options because they do have different side effects. Um, and depending on your age and your desires for fertility, as well as um, you know, your thoughts about natural menopause versus radiation induced menopause and those changes, you have choices you can make. For women with more advanced disease, the backbone of our treatment here is gonna be radiation. And the radiation includes external radiation um, to the outside that then delivers a treatment dose to the cervix. And then we do what's called brachytherapy. And I'll show you a picture of this. And that's really very localized radiation just to the cervix. So we can boost the dose of radiation there uh, to be more successful in terms of curing the cancer. So here's a picture, a cartoon of external beam radiation, and here's where the uterus sits, and here's the blood vessels with the lymph nodes, these little pearls. And so the radiation covers not just the cervix, but the upper part of the vagina, as well as the lymph node basin. Over on the far right, you'll see a picture, it's called brachytherapy. And there is a picture of the uterus with the cervix, and this is actually an implant that the radiation oncologist would place. Usually it's three treatments, sometimes five. Um, and that sits there for a prescribed number of minutes to really develop, to deliver a really high dose of radiation to, to what we call point B. And that just is where we're about five centimeters out. And that's what's called the parametria or the margin around the cancer that we wanna treat. In terms of follow-up, you know, the wonderful thing is about 50% of cases are stage one and the survival rates are more than 90%. Most of the recurrences are gonna happen in the first two to three years. So while we celebrate five-year anniversaries, I celebrate two and three-year anniversaries too because the risk of it coming back is much lower after the first two to three years. So you'll see that since the risk is higher in the first two to three years that we really follow folks a little bit more closely uh, in those first couple years. So. If you have a low risk of your cancer recurring, maybe a very early stage one, we'll see you at six months and then for years one to two, every six to 12 months, and then yearly after that. 
If you have a higher stage or a higher risk cancer, we usually follow you about every three months for the first couple of years and then every six months. And then after five years, you get to graduate to yearly visits. And at this time, sometimes you'll stay with your GYN oncologist, sometimes we'll partner with your gynecologist or your primary care provider. Pap smears after the diagnosis of cervix cancer have not really been shown to really identify early recurrence, um, but we often do them. We just have to be careful of false positives, particularly in patients who have had radiation because that can be pretty common. There's really no data to suggest that we should do routine imaging or scans such as a PET scan or an MRI. Um, however, there are certain individuals, for example, if they had a recurrence of their cancer and we treated a particular area, those are patients that we usually do do CT scans for a couple of years to make sure that they don't have a risk of recurrence. And then the most important thing is just being um, mindful of any symptoms you have and following up with your provider. What are some complications of radiation therapy? So the acute complications are, are nausea, vomiting. You can have some abdominal pain. You can have some urinary symptoms or diarrhea. And that's just because even though they do a lot of 3D planning to minimize the risks of the toxicity of the radiation to the bladder and the, and the rectum, which are really close to the cervix, they still are kind of innocent bystanders and will have some radiation changes. Cytopenias mean your blood counts because of radiation, as well as that low dose of chemotherapy. We have to watch people's counts very carefully to make sure their white counts don't go down and they get a higher risk for infection and don't become too anemic. And then after surgery, sometimes people can have some infectious um, issues if they have radiation after surgery. On the other side, you see the late complications. And these are really some of the long-term sequela of radiation therapy. These things fortunately have gotten much, much less common and we see them much less often now that we've really gotten so much more sophisticated in terms of our radiation. Um, it used to be that it was four field radiation and that the, the radiation beams would come at you from four directions. So think about north, south, east, west. Now they're doing IMRT, which means the beams come from any number, think about 360 rotation, and that really has minimized a lot of these toxicities, which is great. So what happens if the cancer comes back? Well, if it's a local or limited recurrence, we can often do surgery. Sometimes we can do radiation again or radiate a new area. And then we have systemic treatment. Uh, those are IV therapies most commonly for cervix cancer, though now some of the targeted agents we have are oral therapies, and they're very, very promising. Sometimes we do a combination of chemotherapy and targeted agents. So again, we've seen more improvements in terms of options over the last three years than we had in my past 20. Um, so while we wait to eradicate cervix cancer, this provides me some relief. If you have another recurrence and it's not so limited, then again, we sometimes do radiation. And again, surgery will be less likely to benefit. So we look more at systemic treatments. And here's just a very busy laundry list of all the systemic therapies that we have to offer. So there are options, there are curative options. Um, and so should you suffer a recurrence from your cervix cancer, um, while I understand how difficult that is, um, there are options and we can help. Survivorship, you know, um, I think now that we're getting better at curing people, we have to be really cognizant of some of the long-term sequela of the treatments that we offer. So there's physical effects, there's psychosocial effects, and then there's just some clinical considerations. So we have to really be mindful of the physical effects of the treatments that we give, whether it's lymphedema, hot flashes and vaginal dryness because of loss of ovarian function, it could be from surgery or it can be from radiation, pain with intercourse. If you're osteopenic because of your um, loss of estrogen function, we need to manage that. There's chemotherapy effects, most likely um, neuropathy. There's psychosocial effects. There's depression, anxiety, the fear of recurrence is real. Um, body image, the financial toxicities of treatment and lost time from work for you and those that support you during your cancer journey, infertility. And then, you know, as we think about being a cancer survivor from one cancer, we have to think about other things and healthy lifestyle. Um, if you smoke, you need to quit smoking. And then there's things that we can help with to try to improve quality of life, such as vaginal dilators, moisturizers, hormone replacement therapy, and really making it that you can communicate with your care team to find the best options for you. And with that, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank a couple um, colleagues who provided some slides for me today. 
And this will be the end of my presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing. And then Aisha is gonna help me navigate through some questions. Thank you so much. It's been an amazing talk. Thank Very you. Important. Really appreciate it. Um, and of course, I lost my question. Okay, here we go. So I am 70 years old. Do I need a pap smear every year? So it sort of depends. Um, it depends on if you've ever had abnormal pap smears. If you have not had abnormal pap smears, you can stop at the age of 65. If you had had an abnormal pap smear and this is part of that follow-up, it needs to be for 25 years after you had the treatment for your abnormal pap smear. So if that is your circumstance, the answer is yes. So the short answer to that question is maybe. Okay, perfect. What kind of treatments are available if a, can a cervical cancer metastasizes? Yeah, so if it's metastasized and it's not something, you know, sometimes someone can have a metastasis and let's say it's to one lymph node or maybe there's one spot in the lung. If that happens really often, we can operate on that area and remove it. Um, we can also do some local radiation to that area. But if it's metastasized and it's not amenable to kind of a spot treatment, then we kind of get into the chemotherapy realm. Um, another medication that's um, gotten a lot of strength in cervical cancers, they're, we're getting really smart with cervix cancer as with a lot of cancers in that there's a score, it's called your CPS score or PDL1 score for cervix cancer. And we can test your cervix cancer for this score. And if you have a score greater than one, then you're likely to derive a benefit from that medication. So we're really getting pretty personalized. So it's not just about a cancer diagnosis, a drug. Now I can say I have patient X with cancer Y with CPS score T and I put the medication that's likely to work for them. Great. Where does cervical cancer usually metastasize to? So the most, um, you know, cervix cancer likes to stay in its neighborhood before it goes out. And that's the way I think about it. So if it starts in the cervix, stage two would be that it would go out to the tissues beside the cervix. Stage three means it goes further down the vagina and further out, involves lymph nodes. And then stage four means that it's more distantly spread. So those are the patients that'll have, for example, lung metastases and liver metastases. Those would be the most two common sites of metastatic disease but most cervix cancer spreads locally. I think. <clears throat> Can you get cervical cancer after receiving a hysterectomy? Well, it depends. Um, some people, so it's important to know what kind of hysterectomy you have. Um, some doctors will refer to what's called a partial hysterectomy. That can mean a couple of things. It can mean that your uterus and cervix were removed, but they left your ovaries, or it could mean that they took out your uterus, but left your cervix. So it's important when you have a hysterectomy to know what was taken out. I always ask, always ask your provider for your pathology report. They should provide that to you. Um, now with a lot of the electronic health record systems, people can have their pathology reports, but sometimes it's like alphabet soup. It's hard to understand. Um, and so ask your provider, what did you take out? What's left? And what do I need to do? Okay. If you had a supracervical hysterectomy and they did leave your cervix, then you would need to follow regular pap smear screening guidelines. If they took your cervix and you've never had an abnormal pap smear and your cervix was normal, then you don't need pap smears. However, if you had a hysterectomy and they removed your cervix because of precancerous changes, now you're into that. You need a pap smear every year for 25 years because you could develop a vaginal cancer. Oh, <clears throat> okay. Can you get H can you get the HPV vaccine after you've had HPV? Yes, um, absolutely. So we know that 75% of individuals who are sexually active will be exposed to HPV by the age of 21. Um, and the FDA approved has FDA has approved the vaccine up to 45. So absolutely. Um, so we know that there's a primary prevention and there's also the opportunity for secondary prevention. Just because you had one HPV doesn't mean you had all nine. So your body might be able to clear one, but then you have a new circumstance and you're exposed to a new HPV and this could protect you against new HPV. So absolutely. Perfect. If you have had cervical cancer, are you more at risk for other HPV related cancers? 
That's a great question. The answer to that is maybe. Um, it, a lot of it depends on um, which HPV type you had and what other kind of sexual behaviors may you have been involved in that might increase your risk for other HPV related cancers. Okay. <clears throat> Um, what are some ways to tackle HPV vaccine resistance and hesitancy in the U.S.? Wow, yes, that is a fantastic question, and I wish I had a fantastic answer for that <laughs> one. Um, you know, I, I think there's a couple of things. Um, there has been, unfortunately, an assumption that if you, in some circles, not globally, um, and I have no political anything here, but that um, I have heard that if you vaccinate people um, against HPV, that you are promoting sexual promiscuity, um, that they now don't have to worry about cervix cancer, so they're gonna be more promiscuous, similar to the argument that if you provide individuals with birth control pills, they're gonna be more sexually promiscuous because they don't have to worry about pregnancy. That's just nonsensical, in my opinion. Um, that's not giving people credit for being able to think and make wise decisions. So I think that's one issue. Um, and unfortunately, that is a big issue, um, particularly in the South where I live, that, that, that those thoughts exist. We were not helped in this HPV vaccine movement by a couple of things that in missteps that happened very, very early on in HPV coming out. One of the very notable ones was that um, they were trying to get an HPV vaccine program through um, uh, the schools in a big Southern state. I'll leave it at that not North Carolina. Um, and unfortunately, the governor pushed this through, but then it was real. It came out that the governor had significant stock in one of the HPV vaccine companies. And so that conflict of interest really set things so far back. Um, I think the other thing that we need to change in this country is that HPV is not a disease of the female gender. It's a disease of every gender and that um, boys also need to be vaccinated. And that's the only way we're going to eradicate it. So it's really multifactorial. We need to make it free. We need to make it part of the children's vaccine program or CHIP so that parents don't have to pay for it. We need to make it accessible. We need to talk to our pediatrician colleagues and make sure they understand the importance of this vaccine the same way we think about other vaccines. And then we have to really empower our young adults as they go out and they're not with their parents making decisions for them that they can still get the vaccine and have a meaningful change. Right. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> is there a hereditary component to cervical cancer? We don't think so. Um, not like endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer that have more of a hereditary. Now, could there be some hereditary inability for someone's immune system to be able to clear the, the virus if they're exposed? Absolutely. But we're otherwise not really aware of a particular hereditary okay. link. If, um, okay. Can you talk a little bit more about non-HPV related cervical cancers? Yeah, so are there some? Absolutely. Um, it's really a small percentage. And even of that small percentage, um, the thinking is that there is probably some HPV in there somewhere and it's a false negative that it was HPV negative, but there are probably some HPV negative um, cervix cancers. There's a group of cancers called neuroendocrine tumors um, that were felt to really be HPV independent, though most recently they have found HPV 45 in some of the neuroendocrine tumors. So these, those may even have a, hered, a, a HPV related component. There was um, in the past, there was a medication called uh, DES um, that was given to women in the forties and fifties who were at risk for miscarriage. And what happened in their children, so their female children is um, of the DES exposed women is that they were at increased risk for a particular type of cervical cancer called clear cell carcinoma of the cervix and the vagina. Um, those patients have now kind of aged out of that risk of cancer because it was really a cancer in their 20s and 30s. DES went off the market in the 1960s. So we've kind of aged out of that population. Um, unfortunately, 
there were probably some DES um, type drugs that were available in other countries beyond that time. Um, so we might still see some DES exposed patients coming from other portions of Central and South America. Um, but those are really the biggest, the neuroendocrine tumors um, and the DES are the most common of the HPV non-associated cancers. Okay, okay. Um... I think you, you might have answered this already, but after you've had cervical cancer, should you continue to get pap smears and or HPV tests? Probably not an HPV test, um, but pap smears, um, the, the guidelines, both by the Society of G1 Oncology, as well as the NCCN, which is kind of the guiding body for guidelines. And this isn't dictated by insurance companies. And, you know, I talk to patients, I'm like, well, we can do it once a year. We don't need to do it more frequently. And a common question is, well, is that what my insurance company says? No, that's not what your insurance company says. It's at most, you need it once a year. But there is some debate that whether you need a pap smear at all once you have the diagnosis, because we diagnose so few of the recurrences with pap smears, the important thing is being able to come in, talk about your symptoms, look at your cervix, do your exam. The pap smear is a little bit more secondary. I see. Can you speak more about recent advancements in cervical cancer treatment? Yeah, so um, I think there's been really two, two huge things. Um, I think one has been IMRT um, or intensity modulated radiation therapy. Um, and that's where the radiation isn't just coming at the individual north, south, east, west. It's coming really at you in a 360 degree arc. And the really important thing is, is we can develop, deliver a much higher dose of radiation to the cervix in the area we're trying to treat while we're minima minimizing toxicities of the normal tissues. So that really has been huge when you think about we're doing a better job curing people and their survivors. We don't wanna make a physical cripple out of one of our survivors. So that's really a huge step in terms of improving the survivor quality of life, which, which I think is paramount to everything that we do. You know, I think, you know, cancer care 50 years ago, people were just happy to be alive and they were willing to accept anything. I think now we're to the point that we really can say, yes, we're happy to be alive, but I want to have a quality of life on the other side. And so I think we're to that point that we're able to do that. So I think that's been huge. Um, the knowledge that came out in the 90s, it's not recent, but depending how long you've been doing it and how old you are, 90s was recent, um, giving low dose chemotherapy with radiation really increased the survival rates, not just remission rates, but survival rates. So everybody gets some chemotherapy with their radiation. And then I think the next big step has been just this molecularly targeted. I gave the example of the CPS score and the PDL1. That is just the tip of the iceberg. Now we're really looking at some of these um, molecular cocktails so that you, let's say your tumor has mutation ABC. Well, for your particular cancer, you're going to get treatment XYZ for and someone else who has a different mutation, I'm gonna give her a different cocktail or give them a different cocktail. So I think that's really the next advent or the next exciting cusp. However, I really hope to be out of business. And if we could just eradicate cervix cancer completely with the HPV vaccine, if we put all our money and energy into that, we would make a bigger impact than just finding new treatments for those women, individuals that have the disease. We shouldn't stop doing that, but we need to focus on prevention. Absolutely. Um, in the realm of cervical cancer, what is something you find promising and or hopeful? It was sort of segues and tags onto what I just talked about is really some of the new therapies, you know, um, in oncology, we are, we're all very siloed. So if I treat cervix cancer, I treat ovarian cancer, I treat uterine cancer, and the disease treatments were kind of tied to where the cancer was, we've really learned that maybe our disease treatments should be based on the genetics of the cancer. So if you're a particular individual's cancer has a mutation that we see in, in let's say clear cell renal cell in a kidney cancer, well, and there's a drug that's really effective for kidney cancer, maybe I should treat this individual with that drug because the mutation is the same. And those are called basket studies. So we're putting in a basket all the individuals who have a particular mutation, and then we're identifying the targets for that. So that has really led to a very rapid, rapid drug development and drug discovery that's really been very, very um, really fun to be part of. And so the NCI or the National Cancer Institute has any number of basket trials. So 
you know, it's patients with every kind of disease, but they have one common mutation and that's pretty cool. That is really cool. Um, can an HPV vex, uh, can an HPV infection persist even after treating abnormal cell changes and or cervical cancer? Um, so yes, so you know that's why if you have an abnormal pap smear and you have a leap or a cone, even if you don't have cancer, we still recommend pap smears for 25 years because that HPV virus can still persist and lead to problems moving forward. So that's why it's so important to have follow up. Um, with a cervix cancer, yes, I mean, the HPV is still there. That's why the exams are so important. Because um, if you had one HPV that led to your cervix cancer, but maybe you had another HPV that might lead to a little warty area on the outside, those can all be treated very successfully. Okay. All right, just a couple more. Um, how do you think the stigma of HPV and cervical cancer can be addressed? Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful question. Um, and I wish I had a wonderful answer. I think, I think things like this, I think these kinds of conversations um, that really it, it's normal. I mean, 75% of people are going to have HPV right. by their early twenties. I mean, that, I mean, we talk about pandemics. Okay. HPV is a pandemic. Everybody has it, but yeah. not everybody has a problem with it. So we just need to get out of that, that, and it's that same thinking that if you get an HPV vaccine, that you're going to be more promiscuous, that has nothing to do with anything. It's, it just doesn't make sense. So it's having conversations and normalizing guys, everybody has it, right? So we have to figure out how to prevent it. We know how to do that. We need to implement that. Um, but I understand. I understand that sentiment that um, for individuals who have HPV and for individuals who have cervix cancer, they feel, you know, what did I do? It, they, it, it does create a stigma. And I think just having open conversations, normalizing it and, and treating people appropriately to get rid of that stigma is the important thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Leg, lymph leg lymphedema after radiation, how often does that occur? Yeah, so um, it doesn't occur as much after just radiation where we see most of that um, lymphedema is in patients who have had surgery with removal of lymph nodes and they also had radiation. It's like the body can accept or tolerate one insult, but two is hard. Now, there are some patients who will have lymphedema, for example, if they had really significant lymph nodes involved at the time of their diagnosis, and then they had radiation, the lymph node you know, bed just can't recover from that involvement. And so then it becomes, you know, what are some opportunities to treat lymphedema? So physical therapy can be very effective. A lot of massage, there's pump um, pumps that we get for our patients that they can use at home at night. So it's kind of therapeutic massage with the pump. Um, some patients benefit from acupuncture. There is some work being done um, with laser. I think there's a, a trial at, um, in New York City at Memorial Sloan Kettering looking at um, laser, um, sort of like, a, you know, how you have facial rejuvenation with laser. They're kind of doing a lymphatic rejuvenation with laser to oh. see if they can impact and improve on lymphedema. But it is an issue. It probably happens five to 10% of the time. It's probably underreported. Um, patients might notice it, their providers don't. Um, so it, it, it can be a huge quality of life issue. Gotcha. Last question, how likely is cervical cancer to re recur? Um, it depends on your stage. Um, so if you have a, a stage one cervix cancer, um, the risk of recurrence is less than 10%. Um, and that risk goes up um, depending on the stage. So if it's a stage two, the risk of recurrence is about 20 to 30%. Stage three, it's about 40 to 50%. Um, and it kind of goes up from there. So early detection, um, early diagnosis is really, uh, is really key. Same. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Garrick, for an informative program. And thank you to everyone for your great questions. Um, I really appreciate you coming today and speaking with us. Um, everyone, please take a minute to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. The survey will show up in the browser when the webinar ends, and the link will also be in the follow-up email. All surveys are anonymous. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.